joining us today. This is the third in a series of uh, educational programs this year. I'm Dean Grebb, the current president. We had our uh, board meeting yesterday and uh, elected uh, officers for this coming term. And uh, I was re-elected, unfortunately, uh, to uh, most people's uh, dismay. But at any rate, uh, in the back is Doug Elfring. He is our vice president. Stand up, Doug. Wave your hand. Unfortunately, he was elected president. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we also have uh, Agnes over here is our treasurer. And I can say that Dean is a very good president. <laughs> <laughs> My wife told her to say that. Uh, and uh, Ruth uh, Harrison, who is our secretary, is uh, recovering from back surgery. She couldn't be with us today, but she's here in spirit. So thank you again for joining us. Just a couple of quick announcements, and then we'll get started. Uh, I wanted to remind everybody that we have a special educational program May 20th on uh, window preservation, which is kind of a hot topic here in uh, Saline especially. And that will be at the Rensselaer Farm May 20th at 2 p.m. It will be presented by the uh, preservation by design contractor who is restoring all the windows at the Richard Farm. That's why you see that sign up there and some of the windows boarded up, but they'll be done here in about two weeks uh, before the uh, farm opens. The farm opens on May 5th from 11 to 3, uh, every Saturday until uh, October. And uh, of course, we'll be entertaining and educating our second graders uh, starting around the middle of May for about three or four weeks. So. We have uh, roughly four to five hundred uh, second graders that come through the farm to get a little education about how farm life was back in the 1930s. Uh, so let me now introduce Jim Roth, who is our education coordinator. Jim will introduce our speaker today. Jim, Jim Roth. Good. I want to thank all you folks for coming here today. And I was a little worried about our speaker until the last minute showed up. So the question we had was, is he going to have a PowerPoint or is he not going to have a PowerPoint? And I find out now he is. So we're not 100% ready for it, but while he's starting out with the program, we'll get the computer and projector set up and we can see some, some of the stuff. So I'm going to probably squeeze some space on a couple of people right there in the middle. So we'll show it on this wall right here. So John helped us out. Used to, we're here last September. He gave a program on the Civil War. Is that correct? Right. And John is, has been involved. He was born with a family interested in history and reenactment and that type of stuff. So you're the second generation or maybe even more than that. Maybe more. Right. So his roots go back, way back. And in his livelihood, he has worked as a professor of history and Eastern Michigan, special the Civil War in it was like War 1812, that type of stuff. And he's been re reenacting the Civil War himself. So he's gone through it, lived some of the experiences that we read about. And he helped in Monroe to get a national museum there for his Fort, at Fort Custer and that type of stuff. You can tell me to correct me and fill more in. That. So he was involved in employed at Monroe Museum, but with cutbacks and so on, he's now looking for a job. <laughs> so if we hit, if our treasurer can find enough, <laughs> we have a real jewel here, that, but we probably can't afford. So John, it's a pleasure that you came back. So this is the second war he's talking about, and it leads from the actually happened before the Civil War. So, and it's the war that, I reenact the French and Indian War, and we had the Revolutionary War, and the, the treaty from the French and Indian War was not such a good one. What had happened, the French, French claimed the land, English claimed the land, we fought over it, but the Indians lived on the land. So the Indians never did like that treaty that they had because they thought it was theirs, and they didn't care for what happened with it. So it's, it was brewing ever since that war, and War of 1812 comes on, and finally things got settled. 
and the Indians lost even again. So that's that's a short speech. It's all over. Pretty much good. Okay, same with John. 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 Uh, is the, the museum is still operating on a skeleton staff, and uh, one of the things that I find <laughs> frightening about that is that our museum isn't the only one. Most of the museums, if you are familiar with that, uh, and of course, arts, cultural affairs, or anything's cut that. Um, I was shocked when my boss came in. I think about two years ago, I said, well, I know this is going to be a painful fight. I'll do everything I possibly can to keep this open. But if I get fired, I, sorry, laid off, I want you to be the one that did it. And that Friday came, and he looked at me, and he looked down at the ground, and I said, oh, you're here to do it. And he goes, yeah, we got to do it. And I had 24 hours to get all of my stuff out of there. We had just opened up our 150th anniversary of the Civil War stuff, and about 80% of it was my personal collection. And by the enticements that I had, we were hoping to have all these other great collectors. You have to understand. I think uh, looking at the white hair in the audience, we know who loves history. A lot of you have collections. The younger people don't really care about it. And families are now looking at places to put this stuff. I had about five major collectors that want to give stuff to our museum. And when they shut us down, Basically, what they did was they turned their back on these collections. So we're trying to find out the places for them. And even though I'm on unemployment, most of my time is spent trying to get that stuff to some other place because it is a moral and ethical situation we're dealing with, isn't it? That's the problem. We are trying to save all this stuff, all this preservation that goes on, and you are the people that do it. Now, that's the thing that I think bothers me more than anything else. It's not that. We have to do cutbacks. Everybody understands that. It's not that my job was eliminated because I know of at least six people on a Black Thursday, is what they called it up at the State Museum, when they had to get rid of all of them. And they were put in with a DNR. You know, I mean, history in with the Department of Natural Resources? <laughs> Maybe if they change the name of it or something, but those are the things that you should be aware of, and the warning signs are everywhere. This happened in my hometown of Birmingham. They closed that one down. Last week, I was in Troy trying to help out with some of the Troy stuff they're going to be doing for schools. And the Troy Museum just barely survived last year. They're on a skeleton trip. Now, those are pretty rich communities. And if they're having trouble, everybody's having trouble. So congratulate yourselves on being willing to come out here on a Sunday to support history. When you could be watching the Red Wings or the Tigers or five or other things. I always am amazed when I give reenactments that so many people are willing to come out when it's hot or it's cold, when it's rainy, snowy sometimes, to come listen to what we have to say. And almost all the time I have somebody who comes up and goes, you're great. I wish I had a teacher like you in high school. Well, we can't have teachers like that in high school anymore. I'll bet every single person in here had at least one teacher that made school worthwhile. Do you know that 90% of the people in this country say that history was the worst subject that they studied? And why is that? Because we teach it like a math class. Now, I can give you 100 different dates thousand different statistics about what <coughs> regiment the 41st foot fought against the 17th United States and not a single person in here except for me is going to remember that when you walk out of here. And it's not important, but for some reason, those are the ways that we teach history. The other thing that gets me is that if I ask you questions and if I just bring something up and say, what do you know about the War of 1812? Inevitably, somebody will say, well, you know, we had so many men, or we had so many things. Or I'll get a question like, isn't it true that? And you realize what history is? It's not the truth. We were brought up on facts, as if the facts were the truth. 
And I'll tell you, in 40 years of being surrounded by history and knowing some of the greatest historians in the country, they'll tell you there's no such thing as the truth. Now, isn't that shocking if we're talking about real history, what history really is? Because most of you probably think that you can talk about a battle being fought on such and such a date and so many people died. What happened before that? The Battle of Gettysburg, July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1863. That's it, right? No, because there were things leading up to it. There were things going away from it. Some people say what happened a week before is more important than what happened afterwards. It's the interpretation of history that makes it important. Now, here's the other thing. We teach history. And we're right about at this point in my lecture now. We teach history by one old dude standing up here rattling off a bunch of information and all of you are going, well, that's really good. And then six minutes goes by and you go, you know, that chicken dinner, I wonder if I left it in my It's a proven fact. You cannot lecture for more than six minutes without people starting to drift away. That's just the way we are. And the older we get, our short-term memories just go, I can't remember where I left my keys. So that's the truth about history. And I bring that up because when we start talking about these things, there is an emotional attachment to what happened. You have it. You have it here in Saline. You have the Sauk Trail. Now, when I say that, do you start thinking about Michigan Avenue going into Detroit, going into Chicago? Do you start thinking about the mammoths that were walking around here? The great mammoth trail. You think about the Native Americans. You think about the sloth, the fox. You think of all of that. Because that's all part of what happened. I used to teach at South Line High School, and I used to say to kids after we talked a little bit about Pontiac, Pontiac, I'd say, you know, if you guys left this school in 1763, if you were right on this spot, you go back in time, you wouldn't want to be here. Because if you landed where this parking lot was, you know what? You were on the Pontiac Trail, and you're a white boy. And ain't no Indians going to tolerate that. You're going to be somebody's soup. What? I got their attention. But the other thing, this is what makes history great. It's imagination. Imagine what it was like. When I first took over as director of the River Raisin, now National Park, Battlefield, I went to my boss at the time and I said, tell me what happened here. Take me to the battlefield. And it was snowing out. And he said, okay, I'm going to put you at the fence where the worst part of the battle took place. We're talking about hand-to-hand -hand combat, some of the bloodiest fighting in the history of the United States Army. I want you to stand at that spot. And I said, where'd you get the artifacts? Why? Because archaeology is a major component of what we want to do if we find out what happened. And he said, well, about 20 yards from here is where we found the buck and ball. Now, if you know anything about history, if you know anything about guns, that should send shivers up your spine because the Americans were firing buck and ball. Not bullets, but buck and ball. That's small little pellets, buckshot, with one ball in it. Money. 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 Hopefully this will work. And if you understand what buck and ball means, you're not trying to kill somebody, you're trying to viciously wound them. And you do it as a last resort. If you guys over here are attacking me, I want to shoot you. I don't want to kill you. I just want to get as many of you as I can. So I'm shooting buckshot out there. And I'm cutting off pieces of your body. And you're going to get mad and you're going to want to attack me. And the people that are over there attacking are Native Americans who are really ticked off because two days before, these same people came in and cut up members of your family into little pieces took away those pieces as trophies. You know about scalping introduced by the Europeans to the Indians? Not like what you see in the Westerns where you know, all these bloodthirsty Indians are out there and all that. Standing there in that field, he said, here's the other thing you have to do. Take off your shoes because most of the guys fighting here were barefoot. 
So imagine yourself transported a hundred, uh, I'm sorry, two hundred years ago. I keep thinking it's the war here. It's the hundred. We have all these anniversaries going on. You know, it's your 25th anniversary. We've got 50th anniversaries going around. We had the Titanic last night. My daughter works at Greenfield Village, and she was helping the unsinkable Molly Brown walk down the uh, way there last night. Titanic. The Civil War, 150 years ago. Bicentennial of the dumbest war ever fought in American history. How do you really feel? <laughs> this was the worst war ever fought. And here's, here's these boring numbers for you. The British had 48,000, 50,000 regulars, which means that these are pretty good troops, 7,000 native militia troops for 55,000 grand total. The Americans had 39,000 regulars, which probably were nowhere near as good as the British. But they had 460,000 militiamen. Now, if we went back 200 years ago, gentlemen, how many of us are between the ages of 16 and 60? Let's see some hands. <laughs> oh, so we got one volunteer. You'd still be in the militia. When you get to 60, which fortunately I just turned, I'm saying to myself, no, thank goodness I wouldn't have been put in the militia, but you would have been sent in the militia. And if something happened to you, You'd stop what you were doing, run over into your little cabin, grab some bread, grab some water, and your gun, and you were going to fight until you were relieved. That's what the militia was. It evolved a little bit, so it got a little bit better after that, but... I think you have to push the button to keep going. <laughs> Fell asleep. Uh, which one? <coughs> Get it going. Hit, hit the space bar. It's coming here. There it is. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, with those figures, what you see is the United States was going to win the war as far as fighting troops. As long as we could keep fighting, and one other guy kept the British busy in Europe. Overture, right? 1812 Overture? Because who was fighting in Europe? Napoleon. One of the most despised dictators of all time was our ally, basically, in this war. So, it gets interesting, doesn't it? What caused the war? This is an interesting problem, too, because in your textbooks it says impressment of sailors. Arguments over tariffs. All these other things. Uh, the impressment wasn't just sailors. The British crossed over from Sandwich to Detroit here in Michigan Territory and impressed Americans into the British Army. So it wasn't just impressment of sailors. That was a major issue. But the biggest one was the Indians. And we're going to see Governor Hall here in a minute and talk about him. When I talk about history not being a math class, uh, and I don't know if I've told any of you this before, I see some familiar faces in here. I like to talk about this guy. Anybody know who this is? This is a guy that rescued a bunch of cannons out of a uh, Forgotten fort that they named Pennsylvania. Fort Ticonderoga. Fort Ticonderoga was way off on the British frontier at the beginning of the Revolutionary War. And Ethan Allen, who was a notorious pirate and criminal, and a bunch of his drunken buddies, who basically were a gang, ran up there and captured the fort from the British commandant and about eight of his other soldiers. And you have to understand, we have censored history so much that we don't show what really happened. And in some of the original lithographs, it shows the commander of the British forces as they found him in bed with his mistress. And they have the mistress all wrapped up. Well, of course, they had to 
clean that up over the years. But the Ethan Allen situation was very, very tenuous. Everything in the Revolutionary War was cleaned up. And particularly, our dear friend, <laughs> Our dear friend here, who is seen dragging these cannons back to Boston. The reason I bring this guy up is because when I used to do adult ed classes, a lot of the kids in there were teenagers who dropped out, had problems with drugs, a lot of young girls who got pregnant. And they were coming back and they wanted to know, is there somebody that I can emulate? I said, well, how about this guy? This guy was a vastly overweight young man who couldn't see very well and talked with a lift. And every time he talked to people, they kind of went away and said, who is that guy? He also ran a bookstore. And for some weird reason, he loved reading about cannons. So when the Revolutionary War came, since the Continental Army didn't have anybody anything about cannons, they got this weird guy that everybody else today would call the equivalent of a geek. And he made him commander of artillery. And at the crossing of the Delaware, and you've all seen the great picture with George Washington and everybody else there, this guy, for some reason, retained weight while everybody else in the Army was starving. And George Washington never had any young men of his own no sons, but all these other young men kind of gathered around him, and they worshipped him as a father figure. And they all picked each other, just like all teenage boys, young adolescent boys do, and they inevitably picked on this guy. And they picked on him because he was overweight in an army that was starving. So the most important event in American history is about to happen, the crossing of the Delaware. If Washington doesn't win this battle, it's all over. There is no American nation. He's going to be strung up as a traitor. We will not exist. And as we're about to cross the Delaware, this guy comes up to Washington and he says, George, they're picking on me. They're picking on me because I'm too fat. What are we going to do? And Washington, being the brilliant man he is, and I, I hope all of you get a chance to really read about Washington, because he is the great man for America. George turns to him. Knowing that if he says, guys, stop picking on him, just stop going to pick on him. But he has to do something to endear himself to the other one. So he turns to him and he says, Henry, move your fat ass over and don't swing your balls or you're going to knock over the boat. <laughs> Which, of course, everybody there starts laughing. You're just about to fight the most important battle in the history of the United States. And Henry, Henry Knox, Knoxville, Fort Knox, one of the greatest generals in American history is endeared to George Washington. And of course, they go on to win, and everything's wonderful. It's one of the greatest victories in American history. Years later, when Knox is this tough, mean commander of all American armies, he get together with all these guys that fought with him. They'd all be drinking beer and having a great time. And he'd walk up there and he'd smash his hand on the floor. Do you know what my nickname is? And they'd all go, Fat Ass Knox! You know who gave it to me? George freaking Washington. These are tough veteran males in a male society. And I tell this story to my students on the first day of class, and I'll go, you use the word ass. I said, well, if it's good enough for George Washington, it's good enough for me. That's the whole point about history. We've taken this stuff out and dulled it down so that people don't go, wow. And he went on to be the commander of the army and one of the greatest generals that ever lived? Yeah. He was a geek. He was somebody that everybody would laugh at. He was one of the greatest men in American history. And I say that because when we get into things like the War of 1812, you can see just as many stupid things that Americans have done as great things like fat ass knives. That's why this war is so scary. Oh, I do this. this is a great picture, isn't it? Crossing the Delaware. Everybody's looking up there. Ah, that didn't come out well at all. This is the United States, basically, that we're talking about. Michigan Territory is all this area over here. 
there are two little areas of American settlement in the entire area of Michigan Territory as we become part of the United States. So, as you're pointing out, this is not an area that is American at all. This whole area is mostly Native American, mostly run by people that don't like Americans. They don't like the British, they tolerate the French. And that's a major problem when we get down to our battle. This shows you all the different places where battles were fought. Now the greatest land battle in the war was fought in Michigan. And everybody said, no, that's not true. The, we had the Battle of New Orleans. In 1813, we took a little trip down there, you know, get down the mine, we took a little baby, we took a little bean phone. Remember that? Battle of New Orleans? It was after the war, it doesn't count. So you can go out there and brag to people all about how we had the greatest land battle and the war that nobody knows anything about. But we also lost Washington, D.C. The British invaded. Wasn't that terrible? Why would somebody attack somebody else's capital and burn it to the ground? Have any of you ever heard it was in retaliation? The British were retaliating because we burned York, I'm sorry, Toronto, to the ground. We started it. Oh, I guess that's not in the history books either. This is the major campaigns that we had. I don't know if all of you can see this. All this stuff's online, so I won't spend a lot of time going through it. But just realize you had a whole bunch of stuff pointing towards Detroit. Detroit is sort of the epicenter of what happens here in the old Northwest. And that's important for all of us because it sets the tone for what's going to happen. Our army, when the war started, we didn't have an army. Why are you going to go to war if you don't have an army? And who has the greatest navy in the history of the world? The British. So who do we want to take on? I mean, the one great thing about the War of 1812 is that it did establish us as one of the major naval powers in the world. And believe it or not, we did actually win a lot of battles. We also lost a lot of naval but don't give up the ship, the Battle of Lake Erie, all that, that's all part of this. The militia was way too crazy. You couldn't count on the militia. And remember that thing, 450,000 militia men? What's going on with that? You're going to fight the war with a bunch of people my age who don't know what a gun is, basically? Everybody thinks that people on the frontier were great shots and knew everything that wasn't about guns. It isn't really true. Now, in areas where you had a lot of Indian fighting, it's true. But the vast majority of people, when you read diaries and entries, say, I loaded my gun for the first time today. I hit a tree at 10 yards. I guess that's good enough to attack the Indians with. Um, a lot of times, you got one shot off, and then you had to fight with a tomahawk. And a tomahawk is one of the most brutal things in the world. This is a war that's fought with tomahawks and bayonets. And it's really horrible and really bloody. We'll get to that. Leadership questionable. I like to bring this up because, you remember Vietnam? Vietnam was started by a bunch of rejects from World War II. Your great generals went on to become presidents or command the army and then retire. The Korean War was fought by very qualified leadership, but a lot of the middle leadership that had really not seen any action in World War II became the people that fought Vietnam. And for the first couple years of the war, they fought like they were fighting against traditional enemies. And we got our clocks clean. You're fighting a guerrilla war. Name me five guerrilla wars that have ever been won. You can't. That's one. You know, there's a couple of others, but the vast majority of them, if you just keep fighting long enough, the other side's going to surrender. 
By the end of the war in Vietnam, we had some of the most brilliant military commanders there were. They knew how to fight those wars. We fought the first world war with Iraq. Most of the people in charge were like that. We fought the second war with Iraq. Most of those guys had retired. Schwarzkopf was gone. You know? We see this with military, and it happens all the time. The people leading the army at this time were too old to be in the field, or they didn't have enough background. So the tragedy of Detroit, we'll see later. The great thing about the War of 1812 is you get some great military leaders at the very end. President Jackson. And probably the greatest person in the entire history of Michigan. Anybody want to guess? Lewis Cass. Lewis Cass is the reason that Michigan is what it is today. <clears throat> Neither country really wanted to fight this war. So how do you fight a war when the people don't want to? And here's an interesting thing to think about. John C. Calhoun was one of the strongest supporters of a strong federal government. Right? John C. Calhoun caused the Civil War. The reason John C. Calhoun came up with this concept of states' rights was because most of New England was talking about secession. New England wanted to secede from the Federal Union because they didn't want to have anything to do with the War of 1812. So again, problems in the future are caused by problems from the past. Oh, William Hall. William Hall. This guy should have retired, he was 60 years old. <coughs> he was offered command of the armies of the Northwest, and he turned it down. He had no interest in active campaign, even though he fought in the Revolution, and was a decent subordinate. He wasn't a great subordinate, he was a decent guy. But when the war broke out, he basically had to put everything together and run the Michigan Territory. Michigan Territory, is established in 1805. There's two major settlements in the Michigan Territory. One of them is Detroit, and the other one is Michigan Mackinac. Michigan Mackinac is a big trade center. Anybody know what happens to Detroit in 1805? Burns to the ground. This guy takes over at a time when one of the two major cities in the territory is burned to the ground. It's useless. So everything he has to do is going to be difficult for him. Not only that, but he instantly alienates all of the people in the militia. So you and I, we're gonna be in the militia, right? We're told we have to have blue uniforms. Guess who owns all of the material to make uniforms? William Hull. So are we gonna be happy with William Hull? I don't think so. And he's your commanding officer. <laughs> this is the problem that you have starting off with Hall. And Hall's the guy in command here. In 1805, Detroit burns to the ground. Hall becomes the governor. <coughs> Hall begins negotiations immediately with the natives to take over the ground. Now, if I'd been talking 30 years ago, I don't think I'd have the response that I get today. But the vast majority of people today recognize the fact that we stole the land from the Indians. And it's seldom that I talk to an audience where people say, oh, it was a great thing to do, manifest destiny is wonderful. Well, we wouldn't have had a nation if we didn't have manifest destiny. But the way we went about doing it was a holocaust to the Indians. This guy's doing what he's supposed to be doing. But Native Americans didn't own land. They operated in territory. And probably the one tribe that didn't own any property but was used as mercenaries to help other tribes out were the Shawnee. And the Shawnee moved back and forth all the way down to Florida, up to Pennsylvania, up to the Finger Lakes District, fighting with the Iroquois Confederacy, over here to Michigan. They were all over the place. So the Shawnee are a perfect example of some tribes didn't even own territory. So how do you think the Shawnee felt 
when all these white guys are coming in and signing treaties over land that they shared with other tribes. And there's three tribes here in Michigan primarily. There's a fourth one that really I'll get to in a minute. But the three tribes here, the Potawatomis, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewas, and the Odawas. The Odawas go north and south. They have the Great Pontiac Trail. The Potawatomis go through Pinckney in that area. There's a Potawatomi Trail through that. And the Anishinaabe basically own the lakes. They have all the areas up there. And, and they go all the way up into the Upper Peninsula. The problem with talking about Indian history is that you have these ideas written by white men that things like, well, the sacred black hills owned by the Lakota. How long did the Lakota own those hills? 80 years. They stole them from the Absaroka or the Crow. What? Yeah, the sacred black hills were only owned for 80 years. So how could they be sacred? Well, they were sacred to the Crow. They weren't sacred to the Lakota. But when all these people come out there to take it from them, oh, no, these are our sacred black hills. We can't give them up. Who were the people that forced them out of Minnesota? Oh, the Ojibwa. Native American history isn't one of these things where you can say, well, these guys are good, these guys are bad. All of them are doing what all societies do. They push, they shove, they expand, they contract. So it's not an easy thing to talk about when we talk about Native American history. Particularly when you have a guy that comes in here and he starts talking to these guys and say, you want to sign away that property? Yeah, I've never even been there, so you can have it. So a chief from this band of the Potawatomi who's never even been to Detroit says, yeah, you can have Detroit. And the United States government says, yes, he gives it away. If you have any doubt that that's a problem, you know about fishing rights in Lake Superior right now? Anybody here ever look at the maps that shows you most of Lake Superior is owned by different tribes and you can't fish there? And these tribes are also challenging inland waters. A couple years ago, I got an elk hunting permit, the greatest thing in my life. I used to work for the DNR, and I worked really hard to get elk brought back into Michigan. There's only 25 of us that are allowed to hunt elk. But there's 10 Native Americans that are allowed to hunt elk. Well, how can 10 Native Americans, almost a quarter of the people hunting elk, be allowed to hunt elk when all these other people have paid hundreds of dollars to have this right because it's in the treaty? You ever heard people get all upset because Native American children get to go to college? It's in the treaty. It's free education. It's in the treaty. We, we stole Detroit. We stole Kalamazoo. We stole... You see the problem that we have here? When we talk about Native Americans, it's hard to put this whole thing together. And if one chief is selling something he doesn't even own, you can tell sooner or later somebody's going to get upset. And the people most likely to be upset are people who don't even own property to begin with because they have a whole different idea. The Shawnee thought of this country as Indian country, not as Potawatomi country, as the Three Fires did, or Odawa country, or Anishinaabe country. Does that make sense? Because here's the problem. The Shawnee and the people growing up the Shawnee are saying, we should fight to save this land Americans. And that's basically what we wind up doing. This is basically the territory that we're talking about. And in particular, the fighting in this area is important because whoever controls these two spots basically <coughs> controls all the commerce in the Great Lakes. The biggest race that you have when the war starts is to see who can build the most boats to control the Great Lakes. Actually, the Battle of Lake Erie is more important than any of the land battles because once the British are defeated on the Great Lakes, the war is basically over. The British come back and burn in Washington, the British fight in New Orleans, but the war is over by then because they'll never be able to get through here as long as the Americans control this country. When this started, Hall was in Ohio trying to get together his militia. Uh, he didn't accept the command. He tried to build Hall's Road. Really cool thing happened a couple years ago. You know where the water contracted the Great Lakes? They found Hall's Road. It was buried under all this mud, and, and you can even see it. Go online and just type in Hull's Road, and you can see where the road still exists. Um, this year, in July or August, they're going to reenact 
the construction of Halls Row because it was such an important part of bringing transportation into this area. Here's the big one. When the war starts, it's really hard to get information on it because there's no communication. When the war starts, Hull does what he's supposed to do and he invades Canada. He gets all the way to Amherstburg, which is where Fort Malden, where the biggest part of the, the troops are for the Canadian government. And he can't tell it. And he hears this, this sure Indian Confederacy coming together to attack him. So he withdraws back across the straits, hides behind the walls of Fort Detroit, and basically sits there shivering. Now here's a guy who's fought in the revolution, but he's also seen what Native Americans can do. And he's heard about all the other problems the Native Americans have caused. So he's scared to death. And he's guarding all these women and children. He knows what happens to women and children when the Indians get control of the police. He thinks he does. So in August, he surrenders Detroit without even firing a shot. What he doesn't know is that the Indians have about half the soldiers that he does. And it's the great warrior Tecumseh, not Tecumseh, but Tecumseh, who is in charge of all this and brings it about through incredible military maneuvers where he moves all his men around. It makes it look like he has a lot more than everybody thinks he does. Well, Hall is disgraced. But one cool thing happens. This is pretty close to a place called Campus Marshes. Anybody here ever been to Campus Marshes in Detroit? Well, when this happens, one of the guys over there, this is a guy named Louis Cass, our buddy, is so ticked off about this, he stands there and breaks his sword and throws it away rather than give it to the British. For the rest of his life, he detests the British. And 50 years later, something really important happens on that spot that we'll get to at the very end of this. But when Hall is finally brought back to the United States after the prisoners are exchanged, Lewis Cass and the other members of the commanding forces there bring him up on charges. And he's found guilty of cowardice. And they are going to shoot him. In other words, this guy had no reason to do what he did. And Lewis Cass insists that they do something. We showed you the backbone of Lewis Cass. And they come this close to shooting him only because he was a good soldier in the Revolutionary War do they pardon him. But what choice did he have? He didn't know that there were troops coming to help him. He didn't know how long he'd have to hold out. He didn't know how many Indians there were. He didn't know all these things. Plus the fact he's 60 years old. When you're 40 years old, it's hard to ride a horse. When it's 60, come on, an active campaigning? I can't even imagine that. This guy didn't want to be the commander. There's a lot of reasons. Historians now look at Hall as the guy that really got the shaft. There's no reason for us to hate him as much as we did. Lafayette met him at the very end of his life. He came over to him and he said, you know, you've been horribly mistreated just like I was by my own people in France. And it, it wasn't something that should have happened. You were a great man. And Hall dies happy because of that. This is what we think of when we think about the glory of war. All these great men charging and wearing these wonderful uniforms. Uniforms were actually the dumbest thing you could come up with. They weighed too much. They were the wrong material. The hats were stupid. They were designed to make you look much taller than you were, but they didn't keep the sun off you. So a lot of guys wanted to get sunstroke or they froze to death. I mean, there's, this war was just way too stupid. This is what the British looked like. Now, to modern eyes looking at that, you say, that's stupid. Why would you wear red? Well, because most of the battles are fought between big lines of troops shooting at each other. And with those huge hats on, particularly if you're a grenadier, you're usually six feet tall if you're a grenadier. And with this bearskin hat on top of one of these shakos, you are six foot seven, six foot eight. And these little frontier men, the average size is about five foot four, are out there looking at this coming at them. You gotta remember, this is the greatest army in the history of the world. They just defeated Napoleon. They are what you are most afraid of in the world. And who are their friends? The Indians. So Americans are a little bit worried. I like this guy. Isn't this great? <laughs> I mean, isn't that, to those of you that like Pride and Prejudice and 
the Jane Austen novels. This is the period of those wonderful little things. This is what the Americans wore. This is actually the uniform that was worn by um, the Quaz Company out of Monroe. This is what we think they wore in the battle. Um, looks stupid to me, but. <laughs> This is actually what the Americans wore. The most of Americans didn't have the uniform, so they wore something like this. Now, the, the stupid tall hats, of course, again, is, is to try to intimidate people. But something like this, you can see. You know, you're kind of brown, you kind of blend in. The one thing that the Americans had, and this goes all the way back to our friends in the Revolution, the one thing that the Americans had was this mystique about our riflemen. Everybody who was fighting us was scared to death of our riflemen. If they saw guys like this, brown uniforms like this, they would be very, very concerned. When the Americans, and, and I, I keep saying the Americans, I've got I've to really give you an idea who the Americans were. There weren't any Americans really from this area. There were a couple hundred militiamen that some of them fought for the British, some of them fought for the Americans. La Croix Company, which is mostly French, fought with the Americans. The vast majority of the Americans here, though, didn't take any sides because they didn't want to ruin their commerce with the Indians. So you have a few, but the vast majority of these people came from Kentucky. And in fact, after the Battle of River Raisin, there were eight commanding officers who were killed there. And eight counties in Kentucky are named after these men. If you are a child attending school in Kentucky, you know more about Michigan history in the War of 1812 that the vast majority of people that live here. That's because all these men from Kentucky were martyrs. And everywhere you go in Kentucky, there's all this information about them. Typical story is there was an Indian chief that was here at one of the training posts when the Kentuckians came to town. And there were some shots being fired. And, he, and in broken English, he said basically, no worry, me stay. And then a bullet came and just about hit him in the head. And he goes, taint no militia. Them can talk, me run. In other words, they're Kentuckians. Now, why would the Kentuckians be so fearful? Because for basically 200 years, the people that are English, colonists, and Native American tribes have been murdering each other. Just unbelievable murder. You all know about all these stories about the Americans that were killed. But you very seldom hear about the Indians. Davy Crockett who was in the War of 1812, witnessed some of the horror. A whole bunch of Native American women and children were held up in this one building, and they set it on fire. And Davy Crockett said, I never got over the smell of that. And Davy Crockett fought against somebody that he thought was great, Andrew Jackson, and was basically thrown out of Congress because he would not go along with Jackson's idea of removing the Cherokees. He said, that's just wrong. We've never done anything right by these people. And so they threw him out of Congress, to which he said, uh, and I, I think the quote is, to hell with you, I'm going to Texas. We I mean, know what happened to David Crockett in Texas. But the horror of this frightened somebody like Davy Crockett, who was one of the greatest frontiersmen we ever had. That's one of the, the issues that we have here. Uh, there's a, a story that I, I love to tell that gives you an idea of how the horror is. There was a, a young man, and he was 15, 16 years old at the time. Um, the WPA was collecting records, and one of the stories that was told was about this guy. Um, and his grandchildren had heard this story for many years. He, he was vastly in love with this 13-year-old that he just saw. In those days, you didn't have much time recording. So this is a very young man. It's probably the first girl he's ever really had a crush on. And he goes into a trading post, and she's sitting out there with some horses and some guides, and they're about to go further off in the wilderness. And he's kind of concerned, and something just isn't right. And he kind of turns like this to go, I should do something. He runs out the door, and all of a sudden, he comes upon what two minutes ago was this magnificent girl that he was madly in love with. And her head is cut off and her scalp is gone, and her mouth is going like that. And he never forgot that, and went on to personally murder hundreds of Indians in retaliation. In his family, his mother, his father, and seven of his children 
were killed by the Indians. Now, a few years ago, we had somebody who did a lot of research on the Kentucky Indian Wars. And I had a lot of my friends who are Native Americans who were sitting there with me. And we were out at the table, and this guy got out, and he was telling a story about the Kentucky version of this. And he went on and on and on with hundreds of stories. Almost every white family had lost at least one person to the Indians. And at the end of says, of course, for every one person, the Indians lost two or three. Which doesn't really get it to you when it's gone through all these bloody, horrible things. But the battles between the Kentuckians and the Native Americans were as brutal as you could possibly get, which sets up all the stuff that happens here. So when we talk about the War of 1812, we're not talking about a wonderful military engagement where all these wonderful people march out and shoot each other, which is what you're kind of thinking of. It's, it's more a lot of sniping, a lot of guerrilla warfare, and a lot of murder, bloodthirsty murder. And that, that really is hard to try to teach people. We think of the ladies of the era, Pride and Prejudice, magnificent Edwardian gowns, um, there's a big debate among historians whether or not women on the frontier dress like this. There are a few historians that say, yes, they had the latest fashions, they dressed as, as nicely as they possibly could. I think that's kind of hard to fathom that people out here would dress like this, but we do have descriptions of some of the gowns and some of the things that the ladies wore, and they do seem to bear out some of that. So imagine the finery of these ladies out here on the frontier, something with pride and prejudice uh, cut together with the last of the Mohicans. I, I think that's kind of a strange concoction, too. This is kind of typical of what we have for the French. The French have been here for many, 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 many years and have worked with the Indians. They've been adopted by the Indians. Most of them are intermarried with the Indians. Most French have some blood in them. So there, there's very little animosity between them, and, and they're waiting to find out who's going to win. In the battle, most of the French, because it's called Frenchtown, because it was a French settlement. In the battle here, most of the French sat and watched. They didn't want to really get involved with it. There, there are exceptions, but most of them have a lot of Indian dress. And here's our Native Americans. And I bring this up because most people, when they talk about Native Americans, you think of them with a lot of feathers, with all kinds of great anort, and ornate uh, fur and things on them. Living in wigwams that are basically, they use a lot of sailcloth, they did a lot of training. Our wigwams, uh, we made seven wigwams when I was a director down there. We had our own Native American village. And uh, we did not have the traditional birch bark, there's no birch bark in this part of the country. Um, so we just had canvas. They did a lot of trading with the salesmen. When their sales would fall apart, the, the sales would be given to the Indians or traded with the Indians, and the Indians used those for their homes. So this is basically what the Indians' homes would look like. Here's another example of it. Not at all like the TVs that everybody thinks of. This is at Mississinawa, which is the largest 1812 reenactment it takes place, I think it's the first or second week in October every year, and it's definitely worth going to if you want to find out about that kind of culture. This is the typical Native American from the period. And I say typical because of the headdress he's wearing. Every time I bring people into the museum, they want to go, well, where are the big headdresses? And that's it. They go like, so that looks like Arabic. It's a turban. Yeah, exactly. That's a turban. That's a turban. Wow, imagine going to battle in that thing. That's a chair view warrior. This is very typical of probably what the warriors look like that we're fighting in this area. Although, there are a lot of descriptions of it, even though the, the temperature was probably around 20 degrees and they had three foot snow drifts here when the battle took place, they said most of the Native Americans stripped naked except for their breech clouds. And they covered themselves with bear grease. Now, that's going to be pretty hard to take, too. you got these huge British guys coming at you and these Native Americans who are saying, it's not cold. Well, you're standing there barefoot in the snow, and you're from Kentucky. Here's another wonderful example. And, and I particularly bring this one up. Probably if you had any training or any education in Indians at all, you've seen this one. Now, this, this is a poorly done portrait 
of the original that showed this gentleman wearing a buckskin jacket. This gentleman was described as one of the most magnificent men that ever lived. Men loved him. They thought he was, you know, very, very handsome. They thought he was really intellectual, wonderful to talk to, had a lot of sense of humor, uh, spoke 15 or 16 languages. He's been changed here to look like he's a British soldier. He always wore the medal around his neck, and he almost always wore this turban. Um, he had his earlobes pierced and had three different metal things hanging from him that came all the way to his shoulder. His hair came all the way down to his bottom. This is Tecumseh, Tecumseh. And this is what we have come to know him as Tecumseh. I like to think of him as George Clooney, somebody like that, that pretty much men go, yeah, yeah, that guy's not bad looking, you know, and, and the women will go, oh, wow, that guy's great. He walked in a room and people instantly goes, wow, there's that guy. William Henry Harrison, who's the bad guy, later became our president in all this, described him as one of the most magnificent creatures on the earth. If he had been born in white society, he would be a Caesar. He was that commanding. So the whole concept of who this guy is, you know, they said that the portrait never really capture him, if indeed it is even Tecumseh. Hmm. Here's another picture. This is an American picture. Typical, probably looking Indian. Uh, you know. And this is another picture of him. Uh, this is definitely Tecumseh, but we think it was probably his son. This was done many years later. But people that saw this picture said it looked very much like he did. So you get an idea between those two pictures, the kind of person you're dealing with. And here's his brother. I want to bring this up because Tecumse was born in a very unusual time. His mother was pregnant and they were trying to get him to Chillicothe. And as they were trying to get to town, they were, you know, they said within three arrow shots from downtown where she'd have help. But being a Native American woman, you know, you just popped out babies there on the spot. And when this was happening, they said there's this incredible thing in the sky. This incredible, they called it a meteor, prob or they called it a comet, it's probably a meteor, came up, lit up the sky, and went from one end of the sky to the other. Well, it just so happens that Tecumse belonged to the Panther clan. And his name, which we really, white language doesn't understand Shawnee. I've got a Shawnee dictionary like this, and it's very difficult to try to explain to white people what Shawnee is all about. His, his name is sort of like the panther who shoots across the sky, if that makes any sense. And, and the tha that we have, because we can't really pronounce um, Algonquian the way it should be pronounced, we, we come up with like Mackinac, instead of Mackinac, we just kind of throw it in there. So, Tecumthe is really the way it should be pronounced. And Shawnee has an explanation at the end of the words. This guy is Lelawithinka, and his name was the rattle, or the big noisemaker. See, and there's a difference between a rattle and a noisemaker. We're not sure if it means that he, he made a lot of noise, like he was rattling like a rattlesnake, or whether he made a lot of noise, he was very loud. We, we don't really know, but, but that was his name. And you can see one of his eyes, his right eye, um, was always closed because of a hunting accident. Tecumseh's family had been wiped out in the wars with the United States and Britain. And he was the older brother, his younger brother, Lelawithaka, um, was always in trouble. Now, here's where white history takes over and kind of spins this in a weird way. Tecumseh becomes a superhero, the greatest Indian that ever lived, the magnificent one that, you know, he, he was a great orator. He was in a clan that was known for his oration. He was a great fighter. He was in the Panther clan, a great clan known for fighting. And the two of these clans together combined to make him a great person. He was never a chief of the Shawnee. He was just a very important person there. His brother was known as an alcoholic and somebody who beat his wife and all these other horrible things. Well, the truth, at least through the Shawnee's perspective, is both of them were alcoholics. 
And the reason that Nicom Fay stopped being an alcoholic is he climbed on top of a buffalo, and the buffalo threw him off when he was drunk and, and survived somehow, and gave up drinking liquor. With Leo Withica, he had gone into basically trying to be a shaman. He couldn't do anything else. He was, he was a really bad medicine man. Medicine men are, are both um, religious and medicinal, but he couldn't do either one, and he evidently contracted smallpox or some, something like that. He had this horrible, horrible fever and had a coma, and when he came out of it, he said, I have a new name, I'm Tenskwatawa. I'm the open door to the old ways. And he said he'd been to the Happy Hunting Ground, which is, again, we don't really come up with that right. It basically heaven. And I've talked to the old people, and they've all convinced me that we have to get rid of all these white things. The white men are poisoning us. And the other thing that we need to do is to come together with all the Indians and force the white men out of here. And this happens in 1805. Now, 1805 is an important time because it's between the Battle of Fallen Timbers, which is the first major fight in this area. It's near Toledo, Ohio. It's an area where a tornado went through and knocked down a bunch of trees. Uh, it's also a national park type place if you want to go down there and see it. It's a shopping mall there now, of course. But in that battle, a lot of the Indians realized that they had lands given away that should have been given away. And this is where Tecumthe says, enough, stop it. And just because his brother comes out and says, I've got the solution to this, his brother, with Tecumseh's oration, become a one-two team that starts going around and saying to tribes, look, we got to stop this. This is stupid. They're going to break us apart one by one and destroy us. we got to start a confederacy. And the tribes start listening. It's also a period where there's a lot of so-called witchcraft. We don't really do that correctly either. But there are a lot of different tribes where these different small chieftains were going off and doing their own thing, signing away land and other things. And, and Leila Withica, Tenskwatawa, comes out and says, well, these guys are witches. we got to get rid of them. And all these small chieftains start to disappear, burned at the stake, killed, murdered. And all of a sudden, these tribes don't have leadership, and they start joining up with the Confederacy. Now, is this good? Is this bad? It depends. But all these tribes start paying attention. Harrison, who wants to take over this area, he's, he's in charge of Ohio. And he wants to be the big guy. He wants to make sure Manifest Destiny takes over. Harrison goes out there and he says, well, if you guys are so great at what you do, I tell you what, stop the rivers from flowing. Or make the sun go away. You know, do something. We don't know how, but somehow the Native Americans knew there was a solar eclipse, and Harrison did. And so Tesquitawa says, okay, well, I'll get together on this day, and at noon I'll make the sun go away. And of course, all the Indians come together, and at noon the sun goes away, and it's almost like you see Harrison go, oh, they fooled me again. This happens time after time with Harrison. He doesn't really seem to be able to outwit what's going on with these guys. And here he is, William Henry Harrison. Typical Virginian, born in aristocracy, wants to make a name of himself, wants to be the head guy, uh, becomes the commander of the troops out here, and you have this ongoing battle between Native Americans and the troops that he's involved with, all these little skirmishes building up to this War of 1812. The most famous of which is this wonderful confrontation at Harrison's house. To give you an idea of the kind of guy that Tecum Thay was, he shows up with 400 Indians and they sit down at a table. Now, as I said, we don't know about facts. We have a lot of oral history. We have a lot of things. But there's this long table. And supposedly, you're going to have Tecumseh at one end. You're going to have Harrison at the other. And so they sit like that. And Tecumseh goes, nah. He starts sitting over here. All of a sudden, Harrison starts getting uncomfortable. He sits over there. Tecumseh moves over. They get closer. And finally, Tecumseh is right like this. And Harrison says, what's going on as he stands up? And Tecumseh basically says, hey, welcome to my world, dude. This is what you white guys do all the time. You're constantly moving and pushing us out of the way. 
And everybody in the crowd kind of laughed, according to some of the sources. We don't know if it's true or not. What we do know is that there's several dozen people that witnessed what happened when they started talking about giving up land. Tecumseh said, we're not going to honor your treaty. And Harrison says, you have to. And Tecumseh really gets ticked off. And he reaches back, because you always kept your tomahawk in the small of your bag. He starts reaching out, gets his tomahawk out, and Harrison pulls out his sword. So here they are. Basically, in Harrison's front yard, civilized Fort Vincennes. And these two people are about to kill each other. And of course, there'll be a major massacre. And they're standing like this, just about to go at it. And they both kind of go, <coughs> OK, not now. But that's what you're coming into in 1811. 1811, you have Tecumseh basically saying to Harris, look, everything's fine. I'm not getting an Indian army. And Tecumseh then disappears, going out to get an Indian army. Now, the Indians have settled not too far away from Purdue. They have this nice little place. It's called Prophet's Town, because white people call Tenskwatawa, the prophet, the mystic, the messiah, they have all these names. He called himself the open door. He's just saying, you know, we're, we're peaceful people. He wanted to have a capital of the Indian Republic in Indiana. That's what we call it, Indiana. And he had this nice little village there. While Harrison, while Tecumseh's gone, says, I can get in there and get it. Now, the battle, which is very, very hardly contested, it's late in the year, it's in November. Basically, the Indians know that in the morning, if they don't attack, something's going to happen. The Indians attack in the night. There's fighting all during the day. At the end of it, the Indians, as Indians always do, left the field. Because standing there waiting for you know, military units to come in and attack you is the way the Indians fought. The Americans suffered much higher casualties. And the Indians dispersed. And of course, Harrison says, oh, we won the battle, and burns Prophet's town to the ground. Now, that could have been the end of the Indian Confederacy, but something happened in New Madrid. There was the largest earthquake in the history of the North American continent. And there were four other earthquakes that went along with them. And if you remember, the Comstock said, or Harrison said, make the river flow a different direction or stop flowing. And the Mississippi actually did stop and went north for a while. And people all freaked out. So while you could have had the destruction of the Indian alliance, it actually went the other direction. While all this is going on here, the boring part is going on between the British emissaries and the American embassies. And it just keeps building and building and building and building until the Americans go, oh, what the heck, let's start a war. And they do it two days after the British say, well, we're going to give in to your demands. We're not going to cause any more problems with your shipping. We won't. In other words, there was no reason for the war, but the Americans wanted to fight it. <coughs> and you have two major areas of fighting. You have all the problems that went on in 1814. We almost lost the United States in 1814. We were stupid. And as you know, the White House burned to the ground. We came this close to losing it all. And the Star Spangled Banner, you know, that's probably the only thing that saved us, those guys not giving in in Baltimore. But that part, you know, we all, we could have gone to Philadelphia, we could have retreated anywhere. But then that would have been a major, major world war. By that time, the British were tired of fighting. So they basically said, if you take over that area, that's it, we quit. And better than one leads is after that. But what about here in Michigan? This is the Battle of Frenchtown. This is what you really want to know about because it has so much to do with why we have a national park down there. It's a small little area. It just happened to be between Detroit and where the Kentuckians were coming up. Now, the biggest area for the Kentuckians, anybody ever been to Fort Meigs? Yeah. You know what? Fort Meigs is awesome, isn't it? The thing that gets me is that we have Michelin Mackinac here in Michigan. And everybody goes up and sees it. Wow, that's a great fort. Fort Meigs is even better. Now, it's the War of 1812, but you can go in there, and anything you want to know about the War of 1812 is there. 
that is an incredible thing, run by the Ohio Historical Society. I say that because that used to be my sister's site. And we did everything we could to promote it. If you go down to Monroe, please do. Check out the National Park, which is okay. But also drive down to Ohio, Maumee, Ohio, and see Fort Meigs, because it'll put the whole war in perspective. That's where the real struggle for the hinterlands took place. Because we got our clocks playing here. The battle itself oops, takes place in the middle of winter. This is actually uh, in the spring, but it shows you what the Americans' typical uniforms they had. Native Americans attacked the right flank. Um, let me tell you about the American commander. He was also one of these guys that had been in the Revolutionary War. And everybody kind of thought he was an idiot. To give you an idea of how much the men hated him, they knew every morning he'd get up and evacuate his bowels and have his little time where he'd go over. Well, they found out that he always went over and, and used a tree to sit on. So one day, what they did is they cut the tree in half, so when he sat on it, of course, he fell down. Now, for soldiers to put that into their memoirs, you can be sure they hated the guy. When the battle took place, he was a mile away from where the battle occurred. They never should have left Harrison's army and come this far up north. And the battle itself was a foregone conclusion. The British came across the frozen Lake Erie, and really warm uniforms, coats and everything else. The Americans were in these small little linen uniforms. Most of them didn't have shoes. They said after the surrender, a lot of them didn't even have shirts. They were just wearing blankets over their tops. And the American army was in no shape to fight. The Kentuckians who held the left side actually thought they were winning when the British came over and asked for their surrender. They said, why are we surrendering? Well, your, your commander surrendered. They go, Winchester surrendered? That guy's an idiot. They didn't even know that the battle was over because Winchester didn't say anything. So that's part of the problem. This is one of the greatest military defeats in American history. Why would we make it into a national park? Nobody wanted to until the bicentennial came up. This is the kind of clothing that the Americans wore. And you can see they're kind of running around going, oh, we're the British. And these are the conditions. This is actually an artillery crew that came in from Fort Malden. Uh, we have a lot of Canadians that come in to work with us. The Bicentennial is the celebration of 200 years of friendship. No other two countries in the world have had undefended borders for 200 years. We're the only two. And every time we talk to the Canadians, they just go on and on about how great it is, how wonderful the Americans are, how wonderful we get along and everything else. This is going to be a huge celebration for them. Because this is what they look at as their war for independence. Because otherwise they'd be Americans. And they sure don't want to have anything to do with us as far as government goes. But this is great. This is what this is all about for them. So they come over. We can't get enough Americans to reenact the battle. We get a lot of Canadians. This is the design for the battlefield that we came up with. This is the sled that the British brought in here. They had to drag this cannon sled across Lake Erie to put it in the battle. And we had maybe you know, 15, 16 shots that rang out. And the vast majority of them, said, landed in the river. So we found two or three cannonballs that could have possibly come from that. But every year, somebody comes up and shows us a cannonball, and puts it down. And I used to have them on my desk all the time. And the guy comes and say, look, here's a cannonball I found. And I look at it and I go, well, uh, I hate to tell you, but that's not a can. What's the right size? It's got it on the battlefield. Yeah. There was a paper mill there. What you have is an industrial ball bearing. <laughs> we have thousands of those. We've only got about three or four cannon balls that actually fired the mill. Which is the other problem we have with all of our artifacts. This is about the size of one of the regiments that's out there fighting. You know, this is like a thousand guys versus a thousand guys. This isn't a, a huge battle. Now this is the site where it happened. Um, like I say, it's a national park now. I don't know if they're charging money for it or not, but I do highly recommend it because it's a national park. And it's here in your state. And let everybody know, tell all your friends because, hey, you know, it's an
which means if they touch you in battle, you get war honors. Now, that was a good way to make sure that you didn't kill off all the males in the tribe and wind up killing the tribe. So county coup, I go up, I touch you, I get some of the power out of you. Um, somebody like Sidney Bull who had 100 some coup feathers is an example of a great, great warrior. Well, Native Americans in this area had the same basic ideas. And if you weren't allowed to go in battle, the next best thing would be to touch one of the enemy who had been wounded honorably in the battle. So you're in the battle, you get wounded, I come over and I touch you, I get coup from a valuable enemy. What's even better is if you cut off his finger or something and you put it on a necklace. What's even better than that is to take his scalp. Or, in some cases, to cut him up and put him into a soup, like they did a visual manner. <laughs> but that's because they're honoring their enemy. This isn't like we're going out there to deface you or something. So a bunch of Potawatomi showed up at this battle and started going door to door and talking to these different wounded veterans. And they thought, you know what, I need more than this. And the other guy said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll kill this guy, you kill that guy. And pretty soon it became a, a major, major problem. And the British who were supposedly there to stop it did nothing. And between 30, the British said eight, and 100 Americans wound up being massacred. And this got into the press, and it got back to Kentucky, and huge numbers of Kentuckians joined the militia. This is probably the best thing that ever happened. And they all went into battle yelling, remember the raisin. Well, this isn't really like the Battle of the Alamo, but it's, you know, for that time period it was. The problem, though, is that none of this was done correctly. And if you notice the tree behind him, it's a palm tree. <laughs> so the guys doing it didn't even know. And if you look really carefully, and, and you can't see it here, but the, the one that they have down at the battlefields, one of the originals that was in the Clemens Library, you can see that there are mountains behind it. There are any mountains in this area. I mean, down in, in Moreau, it's so flat you can't see anything, or you can see forever. Um, so, everything about this is propaganda. This is the kind of reenactments they have. Next year is the bicentennial event. So in January, make sure that you have nothing else to do, go down there and see it. It'll be really awesome. Well, after French Town was left, the Americans, and it might have been two dozen, we're not really sure, out of 800, went down to Fort Max. And this is where all the reinforcements came. This is where Harrison showed up, and he looked at the area and said, I need to make a fort. It's right along the rapids of, um, what is the river down there? Maumee, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking, what is the, it, they call it the Grand Rapids. But anyway, um, it's, it's a wonderful spot to put a fort. And again, go there and see it, because you'll stand up there and look down and realize <laughs> Man, this is, this is like Mount Everest. The, the Indians could not possibly take it. There were two sieges that were fought there, and Tecumseh was part of it. Some of the Americans were captured, and as the Americans were being slaughtered afterwards, which was typical in these kinds of battles, Tecumseh wrote up and he said, hey, stop killing those honorably wounded men. Stop killing these POWs. We're not barbarians like the white guys. Only white people kill the prisoners. And this is another period map that shows you that. Um, the most important event in this area was Perry's victory over the British in the Battle of Lake Erie. That's when the British fleet was basically destroyed and the Americans had control of the Great Lakes. That meant that the British were not going to be involved in this area anymore. They left Detroit, they went back over into um, Fort Malden, and the Americans started going after Harrison decided that it was time to end this whole thing. Um, the Indians kept retreating, kept retreating, and Tecumseh said, look, this is stupid. You know, sooner or later, we got to turn around and fight. I'm tired of this. And the Battle of the Thames was the whole end of this. There's a couple things that really stand out of the Battle of the Thames. One of the uniforms these guys are wearing are the same uniforms that you saw the guys wearing at the Battle of the River Raisin. And when going into battle, these guys all were yelling, remember the raisin. This was an attack called a forlorn hope. There's two of them in American history. One of them was here. The other one was at Fredericksburg in the Civil War. And in both these cases, volunteers went forward and attacked the enemy. When this happened, these Kentucky cavalrymen 
attacked into the Indians, ran through them, turned around, came back the other way. And in doing so, supposedly they killed Tecumseh. Now there's a, a description of Tecumseh fighting, being shot seven or eight times, fighting on and on and on, but he was so badly mangled, they never recovered his body. Native Americans say, well, you never killed him. We let him to fight another day. Into the 1830s and 40s, people on the frontier would say, you know, you need to go to bed tonight and not make any noise, or else Tecumseh will come and hit you. Because the children on the frontier were still scared that Tecumseh was out there someplace. And that gets you back to who this guy really was. We always said nobody won the War of 1812. Things went back almost exactly to the way they were before. And that's the tragedy of this. All these men died. Well, we got the Star Spangled Banner. And we had a lot of things that we could look at as the first great Patriot Acts as a new nation. But we also lost a horrible thing here. There were no winners, but there were losers. And those are the Native Americans. You probably all have heard about the Cherokee Trail of Tears, right? And you know how horrible it was with the Indians, civilized Indians who had their own alphabet, some of them owned their own slaves, were forced by Andrew Jackson to go off into Indian territory, Oklahoma. There were even more Potawatomis that lived in Ohio and Shawnees who were forced to go out there. That's where the Potawatomi Nation is now, is out in Oklahoma. They were forced off their lands here in a much worse Trail of Tears, and nobody's ever heard of it. A bunch of us went to a seminar on it in Ohio, and we're all looking at each other like, what? Potawatomi Trail of Tears? You never heard of that. You know, and, and that's what kind of scares me about Native American history. There's so little of it that we know. We're always astonished to keep finding things like the Shawnee Trail of Tears? Potawatomi Trail of Tears? This is incredible. But that's the problem with the War of 1812. Looking at the way these battles were fought, everything from the Mississippi River to the east was now solidly in American hands. Nothing else was going to change this. Even the Treaty of Ghent had already decided that the Americans were going to get all that territory. And because we had the rest of it with Napoleon, we had gotten the Louisiana Purchase, we probably would own all the property we had there because the British didn't want to fight with the French anymore. But there was one last battle, and that was the Battle of New Orleans. And the weird thing about a lot of these battles is that you started seeing these groups of freed slaves and slaves, freed Indians, Indian slaves, different tribes working together with pirates to fight for our freedom. And only in the 1950s did we find out about John Lafitte and some of the other ones that participated in the Battle of New Orleans, which was the greatest victory in American history. And, and it's so strange to have a battle after the war is over. But it also shows you just how ridiculous this whole thing was. Now, after all this, you done? Yeah. After all this, here's what you get out of this. The Indians are no longer a problem, except out in the western areas. The Sioux Indians and the great fights with Custer, there's no way the Lakota would ever win. You know, it wasn't Custer's last game. It was the Indians' last game. But what happens to the people that fought the war? Well, Winfield Scott became a great hero. Winfield Scott said, we need a military academy. And we need well-trained military officers. And once the military academy was in there, up until the Civil War, you had an entire generation of professional military engineers and soldiers who had nothing to do but build forts and dredge rivers. That contributed to the Civil War. You also had all these junior officers who had seen what happened and then became great men involved with this. Henry Clay, Lewis Cass and John C. Calhoun. And they learned political things here that changed the way they looked at their lives. John C. Calhoun thought about secession. Nobody ever talked about it except for the New Englanders. And all of a sudden, federalism, which was such an important thing, John C. Calhoun started realizing he couldn't get reelected. 
He had to come up with some way to be reelected if he was going to maintain power and run for president. So he thought, hey, states' rights. You know what? We should start talking about secession. John C. Calhoun becomes one of the most important people leading up to secession. And what happens to Lewis Cass? 50 years later, almost to the date that he broke his sword, he again is in Canvas Marshes. And he's talking to a crowd of people, talking about passing a resolution to help the soldiers of that war. He said, I'd like to draft a resolution. And Confederate agents, British agents, basically, in the audience start going around saying, seeing that, they're going to have a draft, they're going to have a draft. And the war was so unpopular at that time that a riot ensues. Lewis Cass's last great speech causes a riot in downtown Detroit. And the men who were there at the time were so upset about it, they volunteer to start what they say is going to be the greatest regiment in the history of the United States Army in honor of Lewis Cass. And they go on to the Battle of Gettysburg, and as I said the last time, they go into the battle with 400 men and walk off the field with 26, which is the greatest loss in American history. And why do I bring all that up? Because US-12 is called the Iron Brigade Highway, named after those guys, brought together by Lewis Cass, who was in the War of 1812. So that tells you why you need to know that. And I know that's way too long and way too boring, but at least it gives you some idea of what historians now think about that war and why it kind of brings this war back into the forefront on the 200th anniversary of World War I. This has been an SCTN production.